that are presented in this text are awesome. They're wonderful. And uh, it shows the responsibility to the nation of Israel. And the more we study about the nation of Israel, the more we understand the end time. We're not in the end time. We're in the prelude to the end time. But to understand why Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, uh, sent His disciples to none but the house of Israel. And then Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, that He had come to the house of Israel. And so there's, there's lessons in this portion of the Gospel of John. And especially as we start here in John chapter 18, there is prophetic meanings, end time meaning, uh, and lessons about the cross and uh, Jesus continuing His lesson to the house of Israel of the Messianic kingdom that He's going to bring to this earth. And though He came into His own in John 1.11 and His own received Him not, but uh, He's still yet going to deal with the nation of Israel. That's what all this end time events are about. And there will still be a new heaven and a new earth. A new earth for the nation of Israel a test run for 1,000 years, but then eternity, and we will be in the new heaven, according to Revelation. But today, in, in, these, in these selected verses, and let me read, beginning in verse 1, and then we'll look at the verses we're going to deal with in my text. When Jesus had spoken these words, or these things, He went forth with His disciples over the brook of Kedron, and uh, there's a great lesson there from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15 and uh, Kings, the second chapter, about the, the, the brook of Kedron uh, and that Israel had to cross over Kedron to get home uh, in that text. But uh, I'm so glad that we have one who has crossed over Jordan and he's crossed over Kedron and he has paved the way and he is the one who said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me and for the nation of Israel and for all of us who will believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. I'm glad that He has crossed over Kedron on His way home. One hymn writer said it like this, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. And I'm glad Jesus went by way of the cross. And so He goes over the brook of Kedron Verse number 2 says, And Judas, who is in, in prophetic words there, uh, prophesied about him in, in Old Testament script, uh, which betrayed him, knew the place. That's important. For Jesus oft times, many times, resorted thither. Don't you, don't you like that King James word? Thither. Re resorted there with his disciples. Judas then having received a band or a squad of men or soldiers and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees come with thither. He came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Uh, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Verse 5. Then answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they answered, uh, Jesus answered, he, they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus answered and said, I've told you that I am He. If therefore you seek Me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which He spake of them which thou gavest Me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. I mean, Simon Peter didn't have time to negotiate anything. Just cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Verse 11, 
Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. Uh, the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so in the text today, it's interesting that every circumstance where Christ has been placed by the Father and through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, every place that, that Jesus, His feet have taken Him, there has always been a revelation of His presence that could not be hid. I, I, I want to speak today about, about sun rays, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. And so the sun rays of the glory of God that is manifested, that is revealed, that is unveiled. Every step, every place, everything Jesus did was with purpose. And it had a divine purpose and it was in great divine love and mercy for you and I. Aren't you glad the Lord loves you today? I know we're Baptists, but could somebody just say it in your heart, amen? <laughs> Aren't you glad that no one ever cared for you like Jesus? That He loves you and He's concerned about you and the steps of a righteous man are ordained by God and every place that our feet take us and the steps that we trod, Jesus knows all about it. So He knows the mountain peaks we're on. He knows when we're in the valley. He knows when we're in the storm. And so when I come to the Garden of Gethsemane and I see these manifestations in these few verses in this 18th chapter, I'm glad that even in the dark clouds there's a ray of the S-O-N. It can't be hid. He was, he was in the cradle. <laughs> A babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And the shepherds came and the wise men came that they might worship Him. But just something about His presence. At the age of 12, He went into the temple and there before the learned doctors of His day staggered their intellect. Something about His glory and His presence. And we do know that when he stood out there on the deck of the ship and the winds and the waves were beating the ship so that it's nigh unto sinking and the disciples are fearful for their lives and they wake him up in the hinder part of the ship and the Son of Man, just all man, but he becomes all God and the sun rays shine forth as he speaks to the winds and the waves and he says, peace, be still. When he comes before the lame, the leper, all, the healing of all manner of sicknesses and diseases, and the raising of the dead, you just can't hide him. And I'm so glad, as I commented on just a few moments ago, I'm glad that one day we shall behold not just glimpses of his glory, but we shall see him in the fullness of his glory. In fact, to show you what He can do, as He, the Son of Man, is the Son of God and manifests His glory, one of these days, these weak vessels of clay, what He could do in the dark cloud and the shadows of the Garden of Gethsemane and make the rays of His glory come forth, I'm glad that He that has begun a good work in me, His Spirit that is planted in this vessel of clay that one day mortal's going to put on immortality and we're going to be victorious ourselves over death, hell, and the grave and the glory of God. I mean, you know, you look at me now and, and perhaps you see a, a, a blemish or a flaw. Surely you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're just human beings and we're weak vessels. But I've already been stamped to be conformed to the image of His Son. And this Christ in me, that when I was just a young lad and uh, used to travel around with, I was 
talking with someone earlier. I uh, used to travel around with my dad and, and Emma Gerald, who pastored the First Baptist Church in Adrian, and, and uh, Do Dr. Donald Kent, uh, Kennedy. And uh, I can remember times that I visited in Adrian, and I remember times that uh, we go to revival meetings and, uh, and, and listen to the Word of God preached, and, and there would begin to be a stirring in my soul and, and a light that began to come forth. And, and in all of those revivals, some, some lady used to travel around all the churches too, and she'd have the children come down and sing, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Anybody know that chorus? I'm not going to make you sing it. Just raise your hand. All right. But I'm so glad that sometimes you may get a, a, a glimpse of that light. Sometimes by the, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, that light shines. Somebody sees a ray of His glory. But then, face to face, Mortal putting on immortality. Corruption putting on incorruption. The light is going to shine as the head of the body of Christ shall shine. I'm so glad that this, there's, we get glimpses of that glory. But for the fullness of it. Alright, let me get into the sermon. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that was more of an introduction than I was going to give. Look at verse number 2. Now here's the revelation. Here, here's a revelation in verse 2 of his habit of prayer. Look at verse 2. And Judas, also which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus many times, oft times, resorted there with his disciples. Christ not only possessed the spirit of prayer. If his spirit's inside of us, we have the spirit of prayer in us. There, I, come, I go to the garden, I come to the garden along, and he walks with me and he talks with me, tells me I am his own, and he speaks to me, and, and I speak to him in my spirit that we, we can pray. We can pray. Uh, the psalmist said that he, he, he gave thanks to the Lord because he heard, Psalms 116, he heard my voice and my supplication. Hannah went before the, the priest Eli. And he marked her mouth. He recognized she's praying, but her lips are not moving. Aren't you glad that you can pray, have the spirit of prayer, and, and we can pray corporately? But not only do we have the privilege to pray, Jesus shows us sometimes it's important to have a place to pray. Doesn't mean we, you can pray anywhere. I pray in my automobile when I'm driving. Some of you pray while you're going to work. Uh, some of you pray coming home from work. Some of you pray when you lay your head down on your pillow at night to go to, go to sleep. And I help you go to sleep. The devil will knock you out if you start talking to the Lord. And he doesn't want you praying. And, uh, but we, we can pray. But if there's a place. In my first pastor was in Hilliard, Florida. I might have told you this somewhere along the way. The first in 1998 to here. And the years I was here, but I had a lady that she had a prayer room up front of her house, and uh, she could pray anywhere in the house, and she did. But she would go up into that prayer room and just had a place there that she got relaxed. When you get familiar with the place, I used to I used to watch my dad uh, when we were in Swainsburg, and Dad was pastoring, and I'd watch him at night. All the lights would go out, and we lived out in the country, and the, there were no street lights, and so it's dark. But sometimes when there was a good full moon or moonlight, I, I could look out the window. Didn't have any problems because we didn't have glass. We just had shutters. And uh, Dad, they would let the cat out. Of course, when you got shutters, the cat comes back in. And anything else that wants to come in. But I would, on a moonlight night, I'd look out the window, and I could see my dad, when he got everybody in bed asleep, dad would walk in and do his hands like that. And he'd just walk around the yard and he would pray. And I, every night, and he would pray. It was a familiar place with him, talking to the unseen, to the eternal. I love to come in here when I'm by myself. 
and I'll sit in one of these chairs sometimes, and I just sit here. And uh, we being good Baptists, I know where everybody sits. So I know you, I know where you're at. And, and when I when I exercise, which I haven't done lately, I pray, but I, I know you know I haven't exercised much. But I would I'd walk around these pews, and I pray for you. Pray for families. Pray for names. Pray for situations. Let the Holy Spirit stir my heart about praying. I think it's important to have a place that you're comfortable and familiar with to spend some time with the Lord. And, and the, Lord, the Lord is teaching us great lessons here. Uh, not only in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't you know the upper room was a special place? Don't you know that when He took His disciples up into the mountain, it was a special place and to listen and to pray? Or, or when, he, when He went by the side of the sea, or sometimes out on the sea, that's a good place when a storm comes up. But let's don't pray just when there's a storm. Amen? I, I think about that psalm again, 116, when he said, I love the Lord because you heard my voice and my supplication. He says, The sorrows of death come past me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. Don't wait till you're in the valley. Amen? Don't wait till you're in a storm. Have a familiar place to pray. And thank God we can pray in our hearts. But have a place sometimes to just get alone quietly and spend some time with the Lord in prayer. I'm encouraged when I see the revelation of the prayer. It was an old hymn we used to sing. I think it was in the modern or the Baptist hymn book that said, Did you think to pray? Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? Did you call upon Christ the Savior? Uh, my, my precious great-grandchildren, and it's been a long time since some of y'all asked me for pictures. I don't know why you don't want to watch those pictures all the time. When the twins, they pray at home school with Danya, and, uh, and then, of course, they pray at the meals. And then Bentley, the, the great-grandson, after they pray, he wants to make sure that they pray in Jesus' name. And so he'll, uh, he'll, he'll always add, and in Jesus' name. There's something about that name, amen? Something special about it. And I'm glad I not only know there's something about that name that's special, but I'm glad that in His name and in His walks and in His rays of glorious sunlight, of the glory of the Lord that I'm encouraged here about my prayer life. Look at verse number 4. Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon Him went forth. I'm not going to develop this this morning, but I, I, I read that sometime earlier this morning and, and I like that knowing went forth. Knowing that He's on His way to Calvary. Knowing that He's going to the cross knowing that they're going to pierce His side and beat His back and put a crown of thorns upon His brow, knowing they're going to put nails in His hands and His feet, knowing the suffering and the anguish, and He went forth. Oh, thank the Lord for the, for the manifestations of His glory. And uh, the, he, the, the manifestation, the unveiling here of His knowledge he knew what he must face. And, and sometimes, read Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, and you'll see something about his knowledge as he's talking to his disciples because they didn't understand. They did not know. They did not understand when he talks about going away that he's going to the cross. And then he's going to ascend, Acts 1.11, ascend up into heaven. They didn't know that. And I've told you before, they didn't even understand. It was hid from them. Even at John chapter 20 and 21. Until they get to the tomb. And then the revelation knowledge comes to them. But the revelation that I see, what he knew, encourages me that we want to know. I want to, I want to have a prayer life and I want to have a Bible study life. 2 Timothy 2.15 is a good place to start. Study. Show yourself approved unto God, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
And my, when you talk about something being hid, but thank God in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration. We've been given the Word of God. Stay in this book. Don't let it just be a nice looking book on, 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 on the bookshelf somewhere or on the table in your home, but let it be the Word of God that gets into our hearts. And I thank God for the revelation of Him knowing. And that's an encouragement to me. Look at verse number 5. <coughs> In verse number 5, there's a revelation of His confession concerning Himself. He says in that fifth verse, They answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am He. And Judas also, which betrayed Him, stood with them. And so they're, they're asking the question, and he's fixing to give a, a revelation, a manifestation, an unveiling of who he is. And I like those words, I am he. Who is it that you seek? Now they're not seeking him like Luke chapter 19 when, when Zacchaeus, Bible says, and, and, and he sought to see who he was. And he climbed up on the limb of a sycamore tree. For Jesus was to pass that way. They're seeking to see Him that they might bring harm to Him. That, 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 that he, they may make Him suffer. And, uh, but He embraces the name, accepts the name, and embraces the route, the course, the journey, and all the, the, that goes with that name. The rejection. He receives that because He has come to do the Father's will. It just encourages me today that I not be ashamed of the name Jesus. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Something about that name. Jesus. 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 Precious. Powerful. There's healing. There's help. There's hope. There's strength. There's encouragement, there's comfort in the name of Jesus. May we be willing to embrace it and, in, and, and let it be our, our daily walk of confession. That's what that revelation speaks to my heart about. And then in verse number 6, As soon then as He had said unto them, I am He, they went backwards and fell to the ground. My, a revelation, a manifestation, an unveiling of His power. They better be thankful the ground was there. Because that same power that spoke to them and drove them to the ground, that same power should have, could have driven them to hell. And by the way, I think it's interesting as He gives this manifestation of His power, I just can't help but notice did you notice that everybody that's his enemies, when they come into his presence, they fall backwards. The enemies fall backwards. I get confused with a lot of junk I see on television. But those that come into his presence that are not his enemies, they come forward. They kneel in his presence. They give reverence in his presence. And Jesus showing this manifestation of Himself after His confession and then showing this manifestation of His power. This is one last proof. This is going to be the last proof that He shows them, I lay down my life. John 10, maybe verse 18. Read the whole 10th chapter. But He says, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. I'm so glad that what Jesus did that He did willingly. He did it to be an obedient to the Father's will. And, and I see that there. Uh, look at the 8th verse. Because of His love for His own and His submission to the Father, the 8th verse says, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. If therefore you seek Me, let these people go. Again, no one ever cared for it like Jesus. And here, here's a, a revelation 
of his care for his own. By the way, this is also what when he said that, let these people go, that's like Moses saying in Exodus chapter 14 about the children of Israel to Pharaoh, let my people go. And when Jesus says that here, it's just a manifestation of what he prayed in the 17th chapter when he prayed for his own. And so he reveals himself and what he speaks to them in this verse, if therefore ye seek me, let these people go. I'm so glad that he's my substitute. Amen. It was Paul that said concerning the Israelites, Paul had a love for his own, his people. And so he said in, in, in uh, uh, Romans 9, 1, and 10, 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And the ninth, ninth chapter, he said, I could wish myself were a curse from Christ for my kinsmen according to the flesh. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying... My heart's desire and prayer for my people is that they might be saved. I could wish myself were a curse and He took the death on Calvary's cross and the curse because of our sins, He took it upon Himself. Romans 5 says, even He commended His love toward us even when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. This is what we see out of uh, Stephen in Acts chapter uh, 7 verse 54 and following we see Stephen when those that stoning him to death Saul giving his consent and Stephen said lay not this sin to their charge that's what Jesus is doing here and then the last verse a revelation of his submission to the father's will he says in that 11th verse then said Jesus unto Peter Put up thy sword into the sheath, the holster, the case. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He who is God, Son of Man, Son of God. He who is God comes with the same purpose, the same plan, the same will, the same desire to finish the work that He sent to me. <coughs> The John 3.16 that God so loved the world. This Savior came and He triumphed victoriously over death, hell, and the grave. And I'm thankful that I have a Savior who has revealed Himself to us through His Word, through the power of His Spirit, and that He loves us so much. He's on His way to the cross. And let me just remind you again, He went there. And if you're in the house today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, in just a few minutes, we're going to sing a hymn that says, Jesus paid it all. Is that the hymn? Yes. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. This suffering of the Savior and there's more suffering to come. But when he goes to Golgotha's hill, he can say it is finished. And because he finished the work, he has provided for us salvation today. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, and by faith alone are you saved. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Today, in your heart of hearts, if you will put your trust, your faith, your hope for eternity with Him, if you'll put all of your faith and trust in Him, not what we do, but what He's already done for us, trust Him today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. And if you don't understand and want to know more, either during the invitation or at the close of the service, I'd like to step in a room and open my Bible and show you what the Bible teaches about salvation.
We just stand by your heads and prayers. We make ready for closing in with us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for the sufficiency of that love and your grace and your mercy. And that, Lord, this love that you're manifesting and you're showing and the suffering of your Son here in Gethsemane, it's for all, even for Judas, e even for these that have treated him so. It would have been for them if they had del delighted their heart's desire to trust in him and not do away with him. I pray today by the ministering of your Holy Spirit across this room, if there be one soul without salvation, that by the Word and by your Holy Spirit, the convincing work of the Word, the convicting work of your Holy Spirit, that their hearts would be touched today and that they would be a seeker to know who is this Jesus. And I pray that I would have the opportunity to show them. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> the closing hymn is 134. this week sometime and tell somebody about Jesus and before you walk away from them invite them to Providence Church we'd love to have any of you stay with us for our monthly meal today it's it's Italian whatever that means I had Chinese last night Italian today may just get some Baptist steak tonight <laughs> any other comments before we close our Minister of Youth, Sean, would you come dismiss us? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you um, just for the words that we were able to hear. I pray that as the word went out, it would deposit into our heart and produce good fruit and help us to just be drawn closer to you. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice and we thank you for your sufferings that you withstood for us and for our salvation. Jesus, you're perfect and we love you. In Jesus' name.